any way for us to comment in the comments for people? Because I've never figured it out and sometimes I'm gonna answer them in the comments. I mean, you should be able to, we're live now, but I think if, is, do you have a comment sidebar? I do, can, but like, it like doesn't comments? let me talk to the people. Oh, people weird. listening, I am trying, to, or people watching, I am trying to answer your questions, but I can't figure it out because I'm not very smart, apparently. Yeah, I don't think there's a way to do it, not like on Get Vocal. Um, it's weird. That I've so, seen, but yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm sitting here like, I'm going to figure it out. Oh, yeah, you can. <laughs> <laughs> maybe someone yeah. in the comments, would, maybe someone watching knows and they could tell yeah, us. Yeah, because you have interacted in the comments. Huh, I'm jealous. No, I we're going to have to like... I, you know, we have um, Christmas break off, and I think I'm going to, like, figure out how to do this correctly while we're, we have the time off, because people just justifiably would like to have their, like, uh, uh, get vocal exclusives that we used to have, so I need to figure out how to do that, and we're going to work it out. It's been, we, you know, there was a lot of change in a small amount of time, and we're all old, so. <laughs> <laughs> Who is it? Rachel tried to get on last week to say hi, but she said it wouldn't work for her, and I think other people have done that um so we should figure out why it doesn't work for people yeah no yeah it's on the list which we is want you guys a long to come list on. You just sometimes don't know how to help you yeah. <laughs> and with that <laughs> hi everybody <laughs> still recovering from not covid uh so um uh, this episode uh was a weird one i started writing it uh, a few days ago but i wrote most of it today in between recording it which is not a thing i've ever done before i would like write and be like i don't know what else to write and so then i would record and then i would write some more and record some more uh so we this is just a haphazard production at this point um but I, this is an episode where you guys weren't really clued in on anything at all. No. Um, and I got some interesting texts from a few of you. So what were your feelings on the episode? I think Kaz said, not to speak for Kaz, but she she said, you made a good case for it being <laughs> keys. I don't know that it was keys, but you made a solid case. It definitely seems possible. We're allowed to curse on here, right? Oh, yeah, of course. <laughs> Because I mean, the first, the the other thing that came to that that I would say is, um, thanks for the mind fuck. Yeah. Because after after like a week of like having the flu and reading the files and getting totally immersed in it, and then Josh is like, oh, by the way, it's Thursday. Here, enjoy an episode. And, <laughs> and, and I'm like, why are you doing this to me? I'm too old for this. Um, <clears throat> but it does. <coughs> I think that um, with over overall, this episode made um, a really good point of of what I think you were going for to begin with was there's a lot of times where we just don't know, and it could be literally one of a million things. There's those ones where you know you definitely know, and it's just a matter of we know the person is deceased, we know who did it, we can't find the body. But this is just like, you know, he didn't evaporate into thin air. You know, something had to have happened. And there's so many different doors and possibilities ranging from, you know, Optum's razor all the way to the insane um, and all the way to the keys of it all. And I think that, you know, these past two episodes really brought that home. And I think that that kind of philosophy can really be applied to a lot of the cases that we've looked at in the past and a lot that we're probably going to look at in the future. Yeah. And I think like two points there is um, the body of it all. So, you know, the Coast Guard has said like Cammy and Eugene's body should have turned up and that's like the open ocean. This is the inlet of a sound of a bay. Like this body if Cammy and Eugene's body should have turned up, this body should have turned up. Um, sure. Because the, the, the distance between Eld Inlet and the open ocean is 100 miles at, at least. Um, so there are many opportunities in salt water where bodies are very buoyant for this body to have turned up. Um, and then second to that, uh, I've already lost my train of thought. Uh, was Maybe that they were doing like they did a couple searches as well because that's what I was thinking of, and you know it just seems like they would have found him. 
Yeah, no, but Cass, you'd made another point that was, it was like less about the body and more about the case in general, whatever it's got, it'll come back if it's important. Oh, <laughs> that, um, um, No, I lost it. You see, get know, out of the immune system and get out of my head, Josh. I know. It's not. It's the non-COVID. <laughs> here, somebody in the Facebook group, while you guys are thinking about what you were going to say, I want to read this comment in the from the Facebook group because it really, this is from Leoba. I, I might be pronouncing that wrong. I'm sorry if I butcher your name. But she said, where is it? If he'd had an accident, the boots are easy to explain. If you aren't wearing lightweight shoes, they're the first thing to go. Even the missing life jacket and other jacket can be explained. If a life jacket doesn't fit, it can be more of a threat than a help. So he could have discarded that as well. But if he drowned, his body would have been floating for some time. Yes, tidal inlets have strong tidal pulls out to sea, but they also have strong tidal pulls back to the inlet. Those tidal patterns are predictable, and I think his body would have been found in the same area as the rest of his stuff. So I thought that was really interesting. <laughs> yeah, there we totally. go. Case yeah. in point. <laughs> <laughs> um, Josh, it was about um, taking like the what we learned from these past two episodes in this case and applying it to a lot of the other cases that we've been looking at in the past and that we're probably going to be looking at in the future. Yeah, and I think that's the thing is like my whole takeaway from all of this, and it's it, it's still to this day the most frustrating case I've ever covered uh, because I think we all have pretty strong opinions about every case we've covered prior to this and this is one where I'm like I don't know and like I I was able to make a very strong case for keys which was not the point the point was just to lay out all the material facts um, but the takeaway was like okay how did we get here and how can we take that and apply it to other cases? And, you know, I, I think we have not done a great job of focusing on Keyes' crimes from 1990, or I guess from post-military to Alaska. You know, we've covered a few in 2005, 2006, 2007, but based on his conversations, it seems like he was most active between 2001 and 2005, and then again, 2010 to 2012. And we've done a lot of great work in that latter half, but we haven't done a ton in the first half. And I think this episode and this investigation into Corey really kind of, A, highlighted how little work we've done for the first half, but also highlighted the components that are going to be really uh, important in that investigation. In that, in that vein, Josh, one of the things, and, you know, I really want to ask, I really want to have this conversation with, with Conquil, you know, if you invite him on to do this one night or if you oh, he'll be, he, we are texting almost uh, all the time. He'll be back. But no, in all seriousness, um, I remember, um, you know, in the in the time before we were both infected with COVID, and we were sitting um, at the at the conference and looking at the, the at good the, days, the before the good times, before it all went wrong. Um, looking at the looking at the timeline, and it just seemed like you know that that period. And I was thinking about this today too. I was listening that period of time from when he gets out of the military. If you look at the timeline and you suspend belief for a second and say, okay, every one of these missing persons or every one of, of these uh, potential homicides we can attribute to keys. It's almost, it's almost like a, like a spree. And, mm -hmm. you know, it, it happened like rapid fire. We're talking like, you know, not like a, a month or, you know, I don't think it was less, but around a month or so, like between, and then, you know, you're I'm sitting there and I'm thinking like, that has to be significant if that's, if that's, you know, if, if we're going to go down that route. And I really want to hear what Kunkel has to say about that, especially coupled with the, you know, him coming out of the military and making that transition from active duty military into civilian life. Well, and that harkens back to something that Tooks, I think, first discovered a few years ago, which is like these things seem to occur in, in threes. 
Mm-hmm. And I know we did talk to Kunkel about it in Dallas, but I think it was at the bar. <laughs> so we should probably circle oh, back oh, to that conversation. Shoot. I wish I was there for that. <laughs> it's like in Saratoga, we talk, talked to him about some interesting things, and I remembered some of it, and I think Shana remembered other parts. Oh, yeah. Then it yeah, was like it was a blur. Really <laughs> yeah, it was I remembered that you were pouring but, that um, wine. That's but, a... <laughs> it was really late. <laughs> that's that's the problem. We have all of our best conversations. We have our best conversations at the bar at like 2 a.m., Kunkel included, where we're like, oh, let's open our fifth bottle of wine yeah. and talk about really important things. <laughs> How dangerous would it be to just record that? <laughs> oh, we could never use that on the show. Uh, <laughs> um, so another thing I want to address is just uh, our thoughts on the Ted Bundy of it all. Cause it was like, I had, this was a like last minute thing while I was like recording while writing. It was like, I wonder if Evergreen has ever come up anywhere else. And so I went on to NamUs and Charlie Project and I was like, holy shit. Uh, so that was like a last minute discovery. Do you think there was any value to that? Uh, Yes, I definitely think uh, there was. I remember the Evergreen connection from, I think, when the tipster came forward who said she remembers seeing Keys there, and I was like, Evergreen, that's where there was a Ted Bundy victim from. Everett, wasn't it? Everett. Oh, I'm sorry. I keep doing that. I keep messing that up. That's right. Okay, yeah. In my head, it's the same. Last week. (laughs) Yes, I did. I did that on Slack. But um, yeah, I thought it was interesting, especially since he says in that clip from the FBI interviews, that if you had to name a favorite, Ted Bundy would be one of them. And, you know, it's easy for folks to say, oh, was he like, like you said in the episode, Josh, he wasn't necessarily mimicking Bundy or copying him or idolizing him or anything. It just so happened he read about a lot of these cases as as, as we have seen with the Dean Koontz novels. And he went to the, some of these places probably because he was familiar with them from reading them or he just so happened to be in the same areas. But I did find value in that. Um, and... Yeah, I guess that's, I lost my train of thought beyond that, but that. No, I mean, I kept thinking uh, we were on a road trip and we were listening to Serial and that road trip took us to Baltimore and we were like, oh, well, we're here. Let's go check out these places. And it's like, we didn't go to Baltimore to, to look. And that's kind of how I was thinking about this. It's like, we know Keyes had studied uh, Bundy. He lived in the area. He was spending all this time in Olympia. I'm sure he knew about Evergreen College. So it's not implausible to think he was like, well, while I'm here, since he and I have these similar interests, maybe I'll go check out this place because he got away with killing someone from there. Yep. Yeah. Just to to like kind of throw this out there to, to everybody that's watching and listening to, I mean, you know, one of the, one of the interesting things about researching keys and all everything surrounding him is that we're essentially doing what, he was doing and josh you bring that up <laughs> like, you bring yeah. that up sometime you know at the beginning of last season you know you brought that up and you know like i feel like and you know everybody in the chat you know tell me if you if you think it you know right wrong or indifferent i think that um if you have an interest in true crime if you have an interest in this type of topic that there are going to be certain serial killers there's going to be certain cases there's going to be certain you know, points in history that everyone is going to know about, you know, like in terms of serial killers, you know, Ted Bundy, Green River Killer, Charles Manson, Asterix, um, you know, like, like things like, like things like that, you know, everybody knows the John Bonet Ramsey case, you know, it's kind of like those, and I'm very loath to use this, but like those kind of like, like pop culture type cases. And, you know, it wouldn't, it doesn't surprise me that if he's a person that was like, well, you know, serial killers interested, maybe a career path for me, that he's going to know those major serial killers to the extent that I do. I think that he was trying to mimic Bundy. I don't think so. I think, I think that he thought that he was better than all of them. Like he's and he's like doing all this stuff and he's like, Oh yeah. Well, look at, Look at these assholes. They really screwed it up. You know, and I'm being a little flippant about it mm-hmm. here. And I don't mean to me, but, you know, like that's that's where I, I think that, you know, he, he's his uh, crossroads with with Bundy's. But I think it starts with, you know, 
Ted Bundy is one of those cases where we know Ted Bundy, but who among us can name all of his victims? Yeah. And that's a good point. Um, this is sort of a little bit of a tangent, but when you mentioned um, Donna Gail Manson, I looked up her Charlie project. I'm familiar with the case. I think most of us, you know, we may have even gotten some of our early true crime reading in was reading about Bundy and we've read everything about it or watched everything about it. But going on to her Charlie project page, which I just pulled up here too, there are a couple names that Megan at the Charlie project mentions in Donna's profile that are names I don't recall ever hearing in the case of Bundy. And I don't know if they were newly added as potential victims, but I found that interesting as well. And that's, you know, not related to keys necessarily, but interesting in that aspect of true crime. And Yeah, no, totally. Um, yeah, it, it just, it was one of those things where like, I was trying to figure out and I wish I'd had the time. Uh, like, what are the odds of, if I had Googled like missing person Everett Community College, like would there be someone or missing person, whatever the school in Johnson, Vermont is, would there be someone like, is this a common thing because college kids do disappear quite frequently or is this a like Bundy keys thing? So it, that's something I'm interested to spend time with. Again, like this was a last minute discovery. <laughs> I can partially um, answer your question. Possible. <laughs> yeah, please do. Oh, sorry. Um, I actually, when I, when um, PIs for the Missing was running a blog <coughs> before we got more heavy into casework, one of the things that um, I was working with Jillian Kuzma on was creating content for our blog to try to, you know, get different cases and topics out there. And one of the files that I started on my computer was um, just like throughout the time period, throughout history, you know, college students who went missing on American campuses. And as you go through, as you go through um, Charlie Project, you find a ton, a ton, a ton. And I started, I mean, I never got to finish it. And it's something that I want to go back to. And it was something that I was like a writing piece that I was working on. But um, it's, it's incredible. And people that you've never heard of. I mean, I grew up, you know, grew up, you know, in my, into my 20s, into my 30s, hearing about Kristen Smart. Um, so, you know, seeing that case play out, you know, to me, it was like watching, you know, like years of history come to fruition. But, you know, when you look past, you know, those ones that we know, there's a lot out there. And historically going back to the 30s, 40s, 50s, up through today. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I think it's uh, it's something I want to spend more time with because I it's also like, what are the odds that a serial killer who had just spent a significant amount of time near this campus uh, was not involved in the disappearance that happened on that campus. Uh, it, it, yeah. Oh, and regarding his um, the jurisdiction on his on his Dewey, um, I don't think I understood your question in Slack, but when I was listening today, it sounded like the Dewey happened in Thurston County. Well, so it's the DUI is interesting because they say it happened on the base, but the base is entirely within Pierce County, but the line is the Nisqually River, um, which you'll remember from the Nisqually Doe, uh, which runs adjacent to the base. So I'm like, was he like, because I, I looked and it's literally, you could be like, <coughs> driving into the base and you would be driving from Thurston to Pierce County. So it was like, was he, is that what happened? Like he got busted as he was like, I don't know how, cause the, the report rule of thumb, says it. The rule of thumb is, is that um, like the County where the crime happens, it's either the County where the crime happens, or if you have a crime with the victim, it could be the County where the, where your perpetrator is versus uh, you know, the, uh, the County where you are, where the, the harm has, has come to, i.e. your victim. In a DWI, it's going to be where it happened, where he was pulled over. I would tend to think, and if there's anybody in the chat that knows better um, than me, because this is my limited knowledge, um, that if he was caught um, DUI on the base, that it would have been handled through the military, that he would have been stopped or arrested by military police and then would have had to face discipline through the through the army through that base but um i if you know generally speaking i believe it would have had to have been in thurston county for them to have jurisdiction and 
Kathleen, you're saying D W L S. There was both. Driving so driving well. So, what is it? She's right. Driving driving with with that. That. Yeah. She sent us that. Yeah. So both <laughs> both were in Thurston County, the DUI and the driving with a license suspended, but the DUI specifically says it happened on the base, but then he was charged in Thurston County, which again, as you know, as a resident, are two separate counties. So, yeah, uh, yeah it's it's a mystery to me. Confusing. It could also be a sloppy typo on it the base, be. near the base, in the vicinity of the base. Not yeah. everybody is as anal retentive about writing complaints as I am. <laughs> yeah, and there are there are parts of the base where literally you leave the base and as soon as you leave the base you're in Thurston County and so that's plausibly what took place. I see a lot of answers in the chat. Thanks guys. Clearing things mm -hmm. up. I can actually see the chat today. It's wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> um, sorry, that was a weird Somebody... uh, time to take a drink of water. That's a good question. How many inlets did they end up dredging or did they only dredge the Eld Inlet? I don't remember. They didn't they dredge did. any. They did a dive search of the Eld in Inlet. Um, I think it was, oh God, uh, 3,000 square yards, if memory serves correct, um, which would have covered just south of Molly's house. Uh, and... <laughs> slightly north of uh, where the canoe was recovered. Um, and then I think a good swath of the inlet from that point to the east. I just don't see how they didn't find him. I really don't if he was there. Um, I know they said that he probably got caught in some fishing nets, but I assume they looked. Yeah. Yeah. Or wouldn't he have surfaced at some point? I mean, it's not like it's uh, like Crescent where it's that deep or anything. So. And again, like much of where he disappeared from at low tide is visible. Uh, what's interesting, and Kunkel and I talked about it a little offline, is a lot of people have come out of the woodwork uh, to talk about this case uh, who knew John or went to school with John. Um, and there is like a stark contrast between the people who went to school with him and the people who knew him prior to going to school. Um, and the people who went to school with him were like, no, he definitely drowned. And everyone else is like, there, it doesn't sit right with me. Um, and uh, Kunkel and I both thought that, that was very interesting. Because uh, like, there has to be a reason that the people who knew him closest to his disappearance were so staunch about what happened uh and i like neither of us could well he had some explanations but i'm not going to go into it publicly but like it was a confusing thing for both of us it is confusing he, you're right yeah. that is what yeah. they've been saying um what um what year was he in college again at the time uh he had just uh i, I want to say yeah. he had his freshman year was 2001 2002 so he was yeah, halfway I've... through his freshman year because I also feel like if you're a freshman, do your friends in college, how well do they really know you, you know, versus your friends back home who you grew up with? And yeah, people can change. It can get into different things. But that is interesting to me as well. If it was his junior year, say, then I could see that being like, no, you guys back home don't really know him that well anymore. And we're convinced he drowned. He did the, like whatever he was taking. I know some people mentioned he um, was kind of a daredevil sort of. So I don't know. But freshman year... I don't know, you're still finding your group sometimes too, so I don't know. It's weird, I can't remember if I talked about this last week or with Brian, but I think about my freshman year of college and how drastically I changed that year, because you were like on your own for the first time and in a new place and surrounded by new people and you're very like pliable at that point in your life. Uh, so yeah, I don't, I don't know what to make of it, but it is yeah. interesting that like, there's such a very clear uh, difference between how people approach the case. I wonder if it has something to do with like the people who went to college with him were there when he disappeared. They saw the searches, they spoke to mm -hmm. the authorities and it may have just sat better with them just because they heard it firsthand and experienced it firsthand. Whereas everyone back home, except for Brian is like, what the, he drowned? This doesn't make sense. Like nobody's talking to them. Yeah. yeah, it kind of reminds me of like Gene and Cammy's families too. Like, you know, maybe the yeah. college friends or like the Gene side, they were like, okay, police said it was drowning, accident. 
we were there, we saw the searches, like you mentioned, Shana, and we're going to accept that for what it is. And the people back home didn't see it firsthand, but they also can't contend with that. So it's interesting. I think it's also information that's being filtered to them. And if you don't have a connection, if they don't have a connection to the friends at the college, where are you getting this information from? You know, and you're also talking about a time period where you didn't have Facebook groups, you didn't have Twitter, you didn't have all of that. Smartphones, you know, texting, yeah. And all that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So how are you like, unless you're looking at like a local newspaper, unless it's one of those, those cases that make national news, what information are you getting? There's also the like knowing the players versus not. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I, I, for me, what it boils down to is did the phone call happen or did it not? And I guess if you know Molly and you know Thomas, um, maybe it's easier to write off like, oh, I could see how they created this phone call out of thin air um, as to where everyone else. It's like it makes no sense that they both on two different occasions recalled this phone call taking place. This brings me to what I was trying to, um, what I was trying to articulate <laughs> uh, via chat last week, which is really hard to do. I mean, like I could have written you guys, you know, like a motion or something, but I didn't think anybody wanted to. <laughs> Next time, please. <laughs> Next time? No, all right. Yeah. Um, yeah. But it's something that I, this is what I was trying to articulate. So when you're looking at, when I'm looking at something like this, when I'm looking at this case file, um, you know, the most fallible and malleable things are the witness statements and observations. I mean, you know, now with the with the amount of true crime content and everything that's out there, you know, pop from, you know, podcast, television, etc. You know, we've all seen, you know, but we've all seen enough about on false confessions, we've seen, you know, police interrogations, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. Right. So it's very, when I look at the statements, and whenever I have, whenever I look at a case fresh, right, like Josh, drops this perverted, you know, like a figuratively drops this file in my lap and says, tell me what you think. You know, one of the first things that I do is I read the statements from all the players. I read the, the law enforcement, you know, like usually like the, the initial report. So I have an idea of like, you know, the who, what, where, when, why, and how. And then you start looking at the statements from, from the people that are interviewed, you know, the friends, the neighbor, the this, the that. And from there, I want to corroborate or not corroborate, uncorroborate um, what, <laughs> what all of these people are are saying, right? So you know, like there's there's certain you know. And I was trying to say this last week. If you take out all the witness statements, where's the corroborating evidence? So, for example, if you take the phone call, and I'm harping on the phone call because it's the easiest example. <clears throat> um, you, the phone, you have two people that say this phone call happened. So you have two people that are a couple. You have two people that were together on the night when this person is alleged to have disappeared and two people who were also intoxicated on, you know, with drugs and alcohol, no judgment. It's just what was going on. Right. So the way that I would want to corroborate that statement, the phone call came in at around 6 a.m., would be look at the phone records. You see, yeah. okay, so if we're talking again about a time where you don't have, you know, nobody has smartphones, nobody, I mean, if you have a cell phone, you're lucky. I mean, I think I had, I think I had a cell phone in 2002. I don't remember. Um, I know I had a cell phone when Dan was deployed and that was 2003, but, you know, that was like my first cell phone. Um, I had just gotten one and it was like it turned off because of lack of payment like 50% of the time. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, you're not we're not talking about information at our fingertips right now, right? Um, so think landline. If he calls from a payphone or a dorm phone to a landline a really easy way to figure out if that phone call was made would be to pull the records from either end. I don't blame law enforcement for not doing that because looking at this, like coming into it and looking at the witness and everything that's going on, you know, they, it, it was most like 
to them, it was most likely, you know, an accidental drowning or somebody that could have been hurt, somebody that was missing. You know, you're, I don't think they went in there with the mindset of let's build a criminal case. But from where yeah. we sit now, how many years in the future, you know, not having that, I can't say definitively that a phone call came in, that the female picked up the phone and it was her friend, John. And John said, hey, I made it across, et cetera. And that happened at six o'clock. I have to put my faith and belief in her story, but I have nothing to corroborate it. And yeah. that's where, you know, you look at this case. And again, like many others you've looked at, many we're looking at in the, in the future and all of those possibilities, all of those doors start opening up to say, this could have happened. This could have happened. This could have happened. And there's, I, there's not enough to really make a decision, which is why today's episode was important because it showed and you went into detail as to how keys could have been a possibility. Is he the only possibility? No. no. Um, is he is he a possibility? Yes. But so is you know you know to, to pull a to pull a page from missing four one one. It could be anything from Bigfoot and no. Alien. <laughs> no, throw that book in the trash. <laughs> Gotcha, Josh. Um, <laughs> that's your compromising my immune system with your files. Um, <clears throat> but anything he could have, he could have called. He could have gotten picked up by a completely different person, not gotten into the canoe. The canoe could, the canoe could have gotten loose. It's, it's in the water. His boots flew over there. Who knows? And that's what's so frustrating. It's you know I said in our in our uh, our chat last week. It reminded it, it. It has like a lot of vibes of the Maura Murray case, and yeah. that's another one that has and will continue to literally drive people insane. Yeah, uh, yeah. Um, that said, uh, did anyone go onto Google Maps and look at that parking lot? No, <laughs> Not yet. no. Okay, I know yeah. French did, and you guys French. <laughs> French has said he will be back next week, so All why right. not? Good. French did. Wait, I, I ask you to go look because it is, it paints a, a picture for you. Uh, it's places we have been physically and digitally. It is this like isolated place with an abandoned house in the woods. Uh, it just... And it's hard for me. I never want to like be uh, manipulated by keys, um, but like it's hard for me not to see that and not be manipulated by keys. If that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. I get it. And what I forget. I think her name's Kate. Her story just mm. putting him so close. Like you, you can't overlook it. It doesn't mean that. Mm keys did it but oh, i think it'd be stupid to overlook such a and her story is really believable i spoke to her and she and it was before and i did too and it was before we ever even knew about john Corey. yeah, <laughs> yeah. and i remember kaz and i driving around there and like i know exactly where she was talking about and it was so close and it was on the way from highway 101 to where he was <laughs> yep and um just the way the person she encountered acted would not surprise me if it was keys up to no good. Because if somebody's dog bites you in the woods, you're going to be upset. You're going to want to get their phone number in case you have to go to the emergency room, or you get an infection. You know, you might be angry that somebody's dog would even bite you and tell want to tell the authorities. But this guy just wanted none of that. Yeah. Which I'm glad because her dog sounds like he bit somebody who deserved it, but uh, yeah, let's clap it up for the dog. Yeah. Yeah. He's a hero. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and it, it reminded me both of Christina's story, but also of the, um, Oh yeah. The, I don't want to, I don't, the crazy woman in Alaska story where oh, this man was following uh, her and then yeah. all of a sudden her dog got aggressive and he ran away. Good point. Good point. Dogs are the smartest people we know. That's true. It also reminds me too of how he was in Texas. He was going to go after the woman, but she had that was it a mastiff or something? She had a big dog. So yeah, maybe he had experience getting bit. He wanted to steer clear after that. 
Yeah. Well, and we talked about his, you know, learning from experiences and maybe that was an experience he learned from. Um, but I did hear from someone today. I was, we were doing our weekly uh, tourist uh, cocktail hour right before this, but someone had mentioned that I guess the dilapidated building in that bog still exists. So I, I guess wow. a Washington Thanks. trip is uh, due again, even though I was just there twice. <laughs> <laughs> time to go back. You can take, go to, take a different Michelle this time. Yeah. <laughs> I know. We'll, we'll know. We'll send Kathleen. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Kathleen, you're up. Into yeah. the bog. Oh, bog. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So, yeah, is there anything else? Like, I, I will say I left, I went in with, like, 30% keys, and I left with 40% keys. Or maybe, no, I left with 50% keys. Uh, what were your feelings from start to finish? I think you just kept reiterating all the reasons I couldn't rule out keys in this case. So I don't think it changed my mind, because I've always felt we couldn't rule them out. But it definitely cemented, like, it could be. I don't I don't know what to think. I'm equally stuck between keys, an accident, or some other form of foul play. I don't, it, I mean, it could be suicide, but I don't necessarily think that it just, I, it's a weird way to do it, but anything is possible. So I'm just stuck between all the options. I'm not ruling anything out. Yeah, I agree. I think uh, maybe it made me lean a little bit more towards keys again after listening to it, just hearing all the, the case for him. Not that it's a high percentage in my mind. I think there's still other possibilities, even so much as maybe another abductor. I think I had talked about on Slack, like perhaps the life jacket and the jacket were discarded because it was an obstacle for an abductor. And, you know, you can't mm -hmm. really maneuver someone too well if they're in a jacket and a, and a life jacket or press a gun to them or get them in a car. Um, so yeah, I, I still think it could have been an abduction, whether it was keys or not. I don't know. It's a big, big mystery. Like Michelle said, it's a Maura Murray case in my mind now. Yeah, that was a, that was an amazing observation. Um, and you know, the other, if you just to build on 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 that, you know, having him take off the the jacket and the and the life vest, um, you know, yeah, easier to maneuver the person into the back of a vehicle, into the trunk of a vehicle, etc. What better way to cripple a person literally and figuratively from escaping you if you have them remove their shoes in Washington near cold water at the end of January. Yeah. 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 Well, and another thing too. someone had mentioned was like he could have removed the shoes on his own because he didn't want to get them wet while he was putting the canoe into the water. Mm -hmm. Also a good point. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It didn't mention that I never I didn't see anything that said that there were socks in the shoes. Yeah, neither did I. No. Hmm. So, yeah, I think, um, you know, it's weird. I um, I think we put, like, this case means a lot to me uh, for reasons I don't entirely understand. Maybe it's just, like, because it is such a mystery. Um, but I think we're going to do our best to keep looking into it, but I'm definitely happy to be moving on because no case has frustrated me more than this case. Um, Here's a good I think, Oh, sorry, I interrupted you. No, no, I was just going to say, I think if we can find out when Tammy's conference is, it could be very eye-opening because it could either mean he wasn't in the area or what if, like, her conference was February 1st or January 31st, and then it lines up oh. with this pattern of, like, doing something Later. right before he's leaving yeah mm -hmm. yeah that is a good point yeah i'm gonna ask around i mean it was a while ago but see if any my florida contacts have any way of finding out oh juniper ann asks sorry if you already talked about this but if it were keys what do you make of the missing person flyer in the notebook found in north dakota so uh i a few people have reached out to me i think it was on reddit another one of his roommates had said that they had someone who was like peripherally part of their friend group named Eric, who shortly after John's disappearance traveled via Amtrak cross country. Uh, and the journal makes references to like Eric and Katie time. So that seems the most likely thing that happened is this person had the flyers because 
they knew John and they were traveling and having to stop at that tra train station. Makes sense. Reddit solved a mystery. <laughs> Uh, yeah, we'll give them <laughs> one <laughs> point. Yes, <laughs> facetiously. Um, yeah, I, I don't think it was Keys at the Amtrak station. He doesn't yeah. know. They said the person who left the uh, journal looked, resembled like John Tory. Yeah. And I don't, I mean, other than being white dudes with brown hair, they don't look alike. Mm -hmm. No, because it's no. like five foot five or six foot three yeah. or and six foot two. Yeah. They and look alike. They're, they just have very different looks. In my opinion. And John was described as um like stocky and keys yeah. was like fit and very trim. Yeah. I... And like just even just looking at pictures of their faces, I would never say they look alike. Yeah. No, yeah. Um, um oh go ahead. Oh, I was going to say a while back, uh someone asked us why Gina de Jesus comes up again. So I don't know mm -hmm. if you wanted to oh Linda asked that. Um, oh, so yeah. So we, and you know, we're pending the FOIA files, but I think we're all quite confident. Uh, there were two NamUs cases that were, we uh, couldn't figure out who they were. And we have determined with a high level of certainty that they are Gina de Jesus and Chioma Gray. And that's important because it means keys is looking again in cleveland which would be our like fourth touchstone with him in cleveland or being interested in the cleveland area uh and then also the ventura area uh which is like he's looking at a lot of girls who disappeared between san luis obispo and uh los angeles county uh within a tight timeline uh, so I think those are very important uh, revelations within the name of 45. There's, okay, well, oh, Heather asked, how could law enforcement rule out some accidental death at that second friend's house and they took their remains to some other property or something? I don't know how they ruled it out. I think there was no evidence that happened, so they just didn't go into that. Yeah. But I mean, I agree, Any anything is possible to me. Um, I don't think it should be ruled out, but what do I know? And they also never ruled out foul play. Like That's the final true. report they, just says no suspects. I think they just had, like, they couldn't search these people's homes. They had no reason to. They had no cause. So I think um, there, there's just no evidence that anything happened except his shoes and canoe yeah. <laughs> ended up on the beach or whatever. I think. Yeah, and imagine if they didn't even find that. I mean, I know. Well, Cassie, that, you and oh, go ahead. You and I talked about uh, at some point during our COVID trip uh, the proximity of this to Cami and Jean, and it was something that you were initially quite struck by. Yeah, I'm trying to remember. In you mean distance wise or time wise? Time wise. Or, time wise. But, well, I guess both. I mean, I think the biggest thing was like. I think it was time wise. The shoe. Uh, the, yes, which the is, shoe as well. When someone drowns <clears throat> wearing clothing, the first thing that's going to come off is a shoe. Uh, so that's not like crazy or super re revelatory. But I, I think for us, the interest was like several days later, no body ever turns up, but a shoe turns up um, and it's placed. Uh, well, and it turns up in a way that feels almost placed. <laughs> Yeah, and I was I was obsessed with the like what did the shoe look like? Like what was it waterlogged? Was it damaged? Was it stained or was it pristine? Did it have the laces? Did it have debris stuck in it? Did it look like somebody who, you know, like like lost a shoe like on uh, like you know while they were while they were walking, which I have questions if that's the case too. <laughs> um, you know, there's a huge there's a huge difference between um between you know a, a shoe that washes up versus um, a shoe that is is placed there and is in relatively good condition. You know, one of the other things too, <clears throat> I forgot where it where it came up, um, but it made me think of um, I think it was in Canada, like all the um, shoes with feet, like the feet that kept washing yeah. up. 
on the mm-hmm. on the shore. Yeah. And you know, it was a it was attributed, if I recall correctly, a lot of it was attributed to people who had either died accidentally or died by suicide. And the, you know, trigger warning everybody if you're eating, the decomposition of the of the bodies, you're going to have that soft tissue breakdown. And the shoe, the foot in the shoe, that shoe is going to weigh it down and pull that apart. The shoe is going to float. Hello? Um, <laughs> it looks like shoe. a floating shoe for a second. <laughs> <laughs> this is a cap that's shaped like a watermelon. Yeah. Um, so you, know, you know, the, the shoes were washing up with these piece, with these portions of, of feet, flesh, bone, etc., I would expect not to be like a, a white guy, but actually, um, I think that was attributed to the 2004 tsunami because they had yes, looked and all right. of these yeah. shoes were from like a specific not only region but time frame, which was mm-hmm. like right around the time of the tsunami. The last time that yeah. I listened to um, like a podcast on that was, um, oh my god, uh, what's it called? Thinking Sideways. <coughs> oh. Wait, deep cuts, deep cuts. <laughs> mm-hmm. I mean, that's like I didn't really follow up on it as as much, but you know, I, either either way, I mean, I would expect, and again, trigger warning, I would expect that if it was Eugene, that the shoe just didn't kind of like slide off his foot and bob onto shore. I would I would expect that there would be. I would not expect it so close in time. And I would expect mm-hmm. there to be some kind of human remains in the in the shoe. And like that, that was like my obsession with this one shoe. <laughs> and now you have more <laughs> shoes that are showing up on on a beach. And it, you know, it takes you, you know, as where as we were driving, and I took like a like a very short video of the area and a couple pictures. Um, but you know, like looking down on it and having spent time, a lot of time in our Airbnb. And kind of understanding <laughs> what that area was was like. Like you're not talking about like a, a place where compared to, for instance, Alaska, where you had a lot of space in between places, you know, even again comparing like, you know, where our Airbnb, our first Airbnb was in Alaska, the space and distance between, you know, the, the houses and the structures there. Um, I just don't, it, it just really, it just really struck me like, okay, if someone's going to plant the shoe, if someone's going to plant John Corey's shoes, how are you doing that in a way where nobody else is seeing, which then brought me back to technology. Welcome to the inside of my head, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> if this was hap- if this case happened today, if John Corey's disappearance happened today, think about, I mean, I think about how, much we'd have to work with ring cameras, home surveillance systems, um, you know, surveillance, surveillance systems um, and cameras on college campuses or along trails and, and tracks or, or in parking lots and stuff, you know, we would have, there would be the possibility. I'm not saying they'd be the greatest cameras. I mean, we've all, we've all watched crime shows. We've all seen forensic files. We know how great that footage is. <laughs> um, and but but it would be something you could if there was like ring doorbell footage of two guys standing next to the canoe from the neighbor's mm. house that would make a huge difference i think in how we looked at this case if there was you know home surveillance of somebody walking on to like a person walking onto the beach dropping some shoes and walking away you're going to be able to i'm pretty sure you're going to be able to tell if they're also wearing shoes and they're just dumping shoes off um you know so it it's it's frustrating you know looking looking back on on this and just not having you know those things that would fill in those little blanks in my head like what did Eugene's shoe look like not a description in a police file not what the detective wrote down or the crime scene tech wrote down the actual photo so i can see it for myself and it's not being filtered through somebody else's lens somebody else's opinion of what a dirty shoe versus a clean shoe versus a waterlogged shoe looks like yeah which reminds me i need to send you pictures of jean shoe but um But John Shu, we do not have photos of, but what we do know is 
the life jacket, the woman who found it, Joan, uh, said it, it was in pristine condition when she found it on her shore. Uh, no dings, no dents, no dirt, nothing. Uh, and also the location that all of those items were found uh, was on a relatively small beach between, uh, are you ready to hear your two favorite words? A boat ramp uh, and then a, a park with another boat ramp. So uh, yeah, exactly. Um, so again, like there are boat ramps everywhere. It means nothing and it means everything at the same time. Uh, and, you know, like Kaz and I noticed when we drove out to the residential area where these items were found, like if you're driving from the highway to the beach, it's the first place you would go. Interesting. Mm. And yeah. it goes back to um, what the source said about him committing the crimes where you could see them from the road. Yeah. yeah. Good point. Yeah. And the road was, and I'm sure that, you know, all of our, all of, uh, you know, our, your, your listeners that, um, that live in Washington uh, could probably explain this a lot better than, than me. Um, but, you know, I felt like everything where we were, we were, it was like, we were driving like on a hill, like we were standing and like looking down onto, you know, the, not just the, the houses, that were that were there but you're looking down onto the beat like you had a vantage point where yeah. you could like i mean <clears throat> i could look down and i could see like somebody's boat ramp in between the houses i mean i think of just like the airbnb it's like the same thing like i was you know standing at the at the top there trying to you know gather my will to walk down all those stairs and you know, to, to see like a straight shot, like down to like the dock that was attached to the side of the house, and and the water and the spiders that were the size <laughs> that I didn't appreciate. Um, Lindley, they were oh, Timberlands, yeah. and yeah, that that was the thing that was always weird to me is not only that everything showed up at the same time, but they all showed up together. Uh, when you think about like. The inlet is narrow, but quite long. Um, and there are a multitude of places they would have turned up. Um, and the fact that they all turned up on the same day within a thousand feet of each other is quite strange, especially because Timberlands are big, chunky boots. Um, also, the, the state that the life jacket was in made it seem like the jacket and the life jacket were taken off simultaneously. Like it wasn't yeah. un like the life jacket wasn't unclipped. Yeah. Like so it was like it was unclipped and then they were both pulled off together because they were like the tied up with one another. Do we know also if remind float? Or do I have to fill up the bathtub? I know, I'm thinking uh <laughs> try this out. <laughs> Science project time. <laughs> yeah. I feel like that's a French project. <laughs> I know, I think he could do. Yes, yeah, let's, let's tell him to get on that. Um, I was um, going to say, too, it kind of reminds me of the Celia Barnes case where the walking stick just magically surfaced a um, couple yeah. days into the search. Yeah, yeah, that's coming that. up in the near future. If you're not um, on Patreon, we got the FOIA files for this case that we covered, or I covered in season one. I think, um, yeah, season one. Robots. And they were, they were quite interesting, so that will be coming up soon. We have some other FOIA files coming from Ben, Ben's been working his little butt off uh <laughs> getting FOIA files for us so I am eager to see what's coming and eager to talk about what we have because there's still a lot that we found over the break that we have not even discussed yet so <laughs> um, stuff I've forgotten half of it already <laughs> yeah I was going through down. slack today being like oh I forgot about that <laughs> or oh I forgot about that <laughs> like yeah, I just even today you mentioned <laughs> Yeah, and even today um, you mentioned something about like Idaho, and I was like, oh, oh yeah, yeah, rabbit hole. Yeah. I like I'm finding so many. So a good friend of mine has been. I bought this really expensive mapping software, which you guys will all get to experience very soon, and I haven't had time to fill it out. So my friend Chris has been, who like has never listened to the show, has been plotting the timeline onto this mapping software and keeps being like have you noticed this pattern before and i'm like no <laughs> so we have like Love fresh that. eyes that is awesome. diving into it. Fresh yeah. Eyes. <laughs> yeah um well with that we have a few minutes left and i would love for uh Twix to tell us about the book you just published 
<laughs> oh yeah, thanks. Um, so actually, do I? Oh yeah, I have a one of my copies here. So it's a true crime trivia book. And it features 350 questions and answers on different cases, um, serial killers, cold cases, unsolved mysteries, heists. There's even a whole chapter on podcasts, which I think there's at least two questions about TCB. I may have been a little biased in positioning those questions <laughs> in the front and the I'll end of the it. chapter. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So it's a pretty big book, too. It, like 300 pages so yeah this just came out this week it's available on amazon right now i'm hoping to probably after the holidays also sell some copies on my website but if anyone's interested i think i, I posted the link in the facebook page um yeah and if, let me know if you have any questions about it if people did pick it up i'd love to hear what you thought if there's any things that surprised you from it because just researching it there were a lot of cases that i thought i knew as a true crime like a lifelong true crime consumer and i was like oh that's actually not what happened or that's interesting i never knew that about this case so yeah i learned a lot doing that book i did a whole book in one weekend okay. <laughs> i did it in a day i read oh my god you actually there. read it the whole thing yes, i could yes. not make it in one day i was like falling asleep <laughs> not because it was boring but because i was staying was up really late. late to do it um and i wish i had taken like score i wish i kept score i was like so concerned in like finding anything that like you needed to be like changed or like any cor corrections that you needed that i didn't even keep score and i wish i had <laughs> yeah I kept score. Right. So, I, oh you did how'd you do oh, yeah, oh, yeah. i did pretty well i um i think i i overall probably got like a 75. wow that's really good okay, okay. but the stuff i didn't know i was floored by because it, oh, cool. it like i said in my little Yes, Josh on the back is in the of back. it. Um, it like it educated me on a lot of misconceptions I had, which is great. You did such a phenomenal job researching it, of course, because that's what you do. But it was you did a really good job. Thanks. I didn't know anything yeah. about. I think it was like the heists chapter, and there was like, <laughs> was there a mafia chapter? I want to say. There, or so I was doing it with me, and I was like, I'm not gonna know anything. Yeah, about I was that. sending, I, I was hilarious to doing this in the middle of the night trying to get corrections to you. <laughs> I know. <laughs> and you told me a couple interesting things, like, well, we don't have to get into it here, but certain cases we're like, no, I think that person's guilty, and maybe you should like kind of reword that <laughs> question. Right. Okay. Lena always knows everyone's guilty, but um. <laughs> Yeah, no, because originally it was supposed to be 10 chapters, but it was going to be way too long. So I do have a chapter of questions on like white collar and organized crime, which, yeah, I don't really get into that mafia stuff too much, but there's some interesting things I uncovered. It. Yeah, yeah. So Wait, I learned a lot from your heist chapter because I know nothing about heists. I'm going to yeah, open up um, this weekend and I'm going to make Dan <coughs> do the entire book with me and we're going to see who does better. <laughs> Love that. I'm going to take bets who will do better on that. <laughs> But yeah, thanks also for the support, guys. Appreciate it. People were asking about Herb Bauermeister uh, this week, oh, which is, yeah. we have FOIA that I would love to cover this case, but our friend Bob Mata is out on the scene, um, I think, as we speak. Yeah. Um, I was texting with him yesterday. Searching. Were you? Okay, I need to be texting <laughs> while they're searching uh, Herb's property. So Bob is from the Defense Diaries, which is like a sleeper cell of a podcast his dad was john wayne gacy's attorney he has information no one else has it's amazing uh we ran an ad in today's episode but he is like out on the scene uh this week covering this live so he can video in there yeah yeah video someone said he's on it's he's so on TikTok. <laughs> instagram it's, someone it's, said his voice was like velvet and a reveal it is. <laughs> it is. Yeah. he has a beautiful yeah. voice yeah, and his producer play. is one of the funniest people you will ever meet in your life. Uh, they're, they're just a dynamic Did duo. So the you listen to the show. Yeah, 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 he, yeah, yeah, Darren. Yeah. yeah. So he's a hero yeah. already in our book. Yeah. 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 No. Fact, but did you FOIA the Herb files before this broke, or because I'm yeah, wondering so if now they're going to be like, yeah. yeah, damn it, yeah. So, um, speaking of, I will be with Darren next week because I'm on vacation, so no new episodes. Um, and we have some, uh, uh, we have the return of the NamUs 45 episodes. Uh, we're going to be sprinkling those in. Um, and so, yeah, I expect those. I think uh, I'm not, I have not committed to doing one more, but we might do one more episode before we break for the holidays. Uh, TBD on that, but 
you will definitely between now and the end of January get some Name is Forty Five episodes, so and we're going to start. Take them down. The other name is yeah. A couple people. They, asked they're us about that. they're back up. I put them back okay. up. Okay. I want you know how to answer people. People. Yeah. No, I was I was gonna put all the bonus stuff under Apple subscriptions, but then I couldn't figure out how to do that, so I just was like, okay. <laughs> so um, <laughs> they're, they're back up. Yeah. Um, so more name is forty five are coming. Lindsay Baum will be the next one, which was felt apt because we covered her case a little bit a in one. today's I episode. <laughs> yeah. Well, no, I'm excited for it because I I know so little about it, and even today or yesterday when I was googling, I was like, oh, there's very clearly a suspect in this case. <laughs> oh, just wait, just wait. Yeah. <laughs> it's probably, in my opinion, the most interesting case I've covered for the name as well. Awesome. Okay, I can't wait to. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, that's yeah. coming, you guys. Um. So. I may see you on the 22nd and I may not. <laughs> You'll get some name is 45s at some point between now and January 19th. And thank you everyone. If you don't hear from me, have a great holiday. Uh, and thank you all. I uh, appreciate your work and uh, you guys are the best. Bye guys. Thanks. Bye. 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 Thanks everyone. Bye.